Today, we're just going to be talking a little bit about bike setup, ride quality, and obviously the Legends products that you guys bring to the industry. So I know you guys are super busy and keep a full schedule. So I just really want to say thank you so much, Jesse, for being here and educating us and taking the time to do this. Um, as we go through and discuss different topics, I really wanted to do this so that I can educate the riders um, out there, not only about the products, but also about their bike and the ride quality they're experiencing. Right. To get started, you know, let's just talk about what you got you this, to this point so far. You know, what really led you to start developing suspension for the Harley industry? Well, way back when, 15, 20 years ago probably, I, I just, I had a soft tail myself and wanted it, I wanted it to be really low so it looked decent, but um, when I, as soon as I did that, obviously realized the ride quality was terrible and I thought there has to be a way to have both. Um, so I started working on the first air suspension for soft tails and that kind of started everything and then uh, it just evolved into all the other products, more suspensions and I think we do maybe 40 or 50 different fitments and suspensions now. So. Yeah, the lineup is definitely impressive, and you guys have done a great job. Um, were there any, you know, big hiccups that you were experiencing when you were first developing? I mean, obviously, the soft tail's an animal, and it's all its own. So can you talk any, a little bit about any problems that you guys had as far as design purpose? Yeah, one of the obvious ones, I mean, that's a daily issue that we always deal with. It's either on the manufacturing side or engineering there's always constraints you're trying to work through but one of the major ones that comes to mind is uh, when we were real early in development we were using a firestone um, air spring and no um no knock on on their brand of rubber and the way they make theirs because they're on probably almost every semi in the world and many other vehicles but for our application we needed an aramid fiber because it's an inherent problem with air springs as you inject air into them. They have to act as a normal spring almost. So they'll want to continue to grow in diameter. And on the soft tails, that was a big problem. We would run into the transmission bolts and all kinds of odds and ends after a few thousand miles. So the biggest hiccup was that rubber just couldn't do. We were, we were able to see in those first couple thousand miles how great it would ride and all the right characteristics, but then it would start to fade and then eventually they would grow and fail. So that was a huge one. And we were literally um, at a standstill and one of the guys at Firestone recommended, he said, there's one company in the world that has something that they've been messing with. And it really wasn't developed too far along at that time. And that's the air spring we use today. And that ended up being Gates Rubber Company, which has now been sold a couple of times, but that was the biggest hiccup. And now, once we got to them, we were able to make a few samples, tested them for about a million miles, and they did as well. Wow. And we knew we had something that would work, but that was kind of disheartening because it was right at the end, and we were, we'd already had a few years of development. And then to have those continually fail on us, we just knew we were that close and it looked like it was over, but it finally, it took a couple more years, but we were able to get that air spring to work. And part of the problem there was trying to convince that rubber company to even work with us because they didn't want to be on motorcycles because there are only two wheels and a number of things. So it's a liability issue is kind of where they were going with that. Yeah. And I was 20 years old. So they're going, what the hell are we doing with this guy? this kid, because I'd show up with an old Suburban with 200,000 miles on it with my bike stuffed in the back <laughs> and hair down to here, and I was a mess. And I'd probably sleep in the Suburban when I'd go before the meeting, so <laughs> I don't know why they did either, but eventually they did. They asked me to leave a couple of times, and I, I knew that there was no way I could keep going if I didn't have that product, so... Eventually, one of the engineers that was about to retire decided to make me samples because uh -huh. um, he knew they couldn't really hurt him. So he made me some when we were told not to, that they wouldn't make me samples, and he made me some anyway, kind of on the sly, before he retired, and that's what I had for samples. 
So he really was a game changer in my life. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be in business. Wow, that's, that's a really impressive story. I mean, it's yeah. amazing what you'll go through and, you know, the luck that you'll find along the way when you're determined to come out with a good product and keep yeah. moving forward with your company. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, I know anyone else that has personally met you knows how passionate you are about your product and how passionate your team is about the brand and what you guys really bring to the industry. And I know you travel across the country to educate riders out there about how important the suspension really is on their motorcycle and what a difference it can make in their ride quality. I heard you joked about people trying to improve the ride quality, you know, changing out their seat. It's not comfortable with my seat when really it's, it's a suspension. It's really going to be a game changer for you. So... Can you go over briefly some of the terms that some of the riders really should be educating themselves about and, you know, really knowing about their bike? Yeah, the biggest one is probably bottoming out. And I think, like you mentioned just a second ago, I don't think uh, maybe most riders are just familiar with what they're feeling and they are misled to maybe the seat or, you know, what, what is my bike really doing? Or they get on the bike and they maybe don't have any past experience with other motorcycles. So it's definitely beneficial to ride off-road and ride a bunch of different types of bikes and those kinds of things, even if you're not into another bike. Right. If your buddy's got it, you should get on it and ride it for a little while to just see what it's like because um, a lot of other bikes on the market, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, um, <laughs> have good suspension and these don't. So. But bottoming out is a terrible feeling. It just feels like the, the rear wheel or the front wheel is not traveling very far, not moving very far. Like it just doesn't have any movement. They really feel like they're already lower in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a weird feeling for a lot of riders that experience our suspension, maybe our demo rides, or if they happen to just buy a set and put them on. It's kind of an unusual feeling for them because the bike – actually rides very, very well. They're not used to having wheel travel and the bike not bottoming out and having the thing corner and perform like it should because they're really almost riding in a sense, especially on the FL models, on a pretty solid strut in a way. It's got very little movement, which is kind of odd for that big of a bike. But the best, you know, and it's really hard to explain but the best thing to do is to try to demo a set of other brands of shocks on your bike, whether it's ours or someone else's, you know, preferably ours, of course. <laughs> um, but it just uh, a lot of dealerships will allow you to put a set on and just ride them for a little while or take a friend's bike. Like I said, we have a lot of customers that buy from us because their friend bought one of our products. Um, they happen to switch bikes for whatever reason and ride for a little bit. And as soon as someone gets that feeling of what it can be like, there's no doubt that they'll buy shocks for their bike. Right. It's kind of like experience it and then you're convinced. Um, so I know you have some good videos out there, but also I know you talk about bottoming out. Can you talk about SAG a little bit? Like what yeah. you're looking for? Yeah, in a nutshell, what SAG is, especially in um, our world in the Harley, it is about a third of the total travel that the suspension has. So if uh, like on the rear FLs, they're about three inches of wheel travel. So we like to have anywhere between a half inch to an, to an inch of sag. So what that means is the bike sitting static with nobody on it, no gear, no anything is going to sit at a certain ride height, usually at the top of its ride height. When the rider sits on it, you measure that shock end to end. You say you get 12 and a half inches, you want them to stand back up, you want to see what that dimension is again, and then have them sit down one more time. That's usually how I do it. If it isn't that half inch to an inch, then you adjust the coil or the air, if it's an air suspension, to get it set about with that amount of sag. That'll allow you to go over heaves in the road just as well as let the wheel drop into holes. It kind of accommodates um, most situations anyway, and seems to be a good rule of thumb. Good to know. Definitely. Um, any other terms that you really feel like, you know, the writers should really kind of hone in on and make themselves aware of? 
Yeah, I mean, an obvious one, um, if, if you're in this, the suspension like we are, is spring rate. And every shock that's out there has a specific style of spring on it, including ours. And spring rate is really what you're feeling when you're going down the road. So you really want to find out if you can. Some companies don't really talk about their spring rate. In all reality, the shocks maybe aren't that much different than what's already on the bike. You might just be buying almost a direct replacement of what's already on there. We're pretty open about our spring rates. It, it's the reason that our shocks ride as well as they do. We run either 90 to 110 pound spring rates, sometimes up to 130. And that depends on the application and the leverage that the shock is under. That's compared to most of the other competitors in the market are about 40 to 60 pounds, somewhere in that range, heavier in spring rate than what we are. And we get away with it by the way we wind our springs and the length of them. So it's kind of an unconventional way, the way we, the length of springs that we use. I'll just kind of leave it at that, but. Trade secrets. <laughs> yeah, but back to the back to the terms. Spring rate is really important, and mm -hmm. you don't see that advertised, but you can get that information on most companies' websites. Okay. And that's what you're feeling on the seat when you're going down the road. It's all about that spring rate. So. Good to know. Yeah, I think a lot of people aren't even really aware of how much they do need to adjust as far as, you know, like you said before, if you wanted your bike lowered, if you were riding solo, if you were riding two up, if you're riding with luggage, all these things really need to be adjusted for to give you the correct ride quality. And I don't really feel like people really understand that. They, they like to think that, you know, this is my stock bike, my stock bike suspension should be able to handle whatever I throw at it. And that just not maybe the case. So um, I know we talked about the Aero ST that you guys really got started with and why you chose to, to start there. Um, how was the initial response with the soft tails up compared to the other models that you guys can run? You really launched off the soft tail models because it was a personal choice. How did the industry kind of respond to that initial launch for you guys? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. They just... Um, we would stand at a trade show or um, because we, we sold our product a lot different back then as well. We, we didn't understand anything about the, the market or the industry. So we didn't use distributors. We were really out there trying to get that retail customer for the most part and dealers along the way, of course. But uh, the response was awful because they didn't understand what we were doing and they didn't trust it. And it was, you know, all you would hear when you're trying to, to talk to the product about someone is, well, it's going to leak or what do you do if it fails? And, you know, like any company, you do your best to make that not happen. We really work hard at that and maybe more than a lot of companies do, other companies do. Um, I'm pretty strong on lifetime warranty and making everything in-house and we do and you can't offer a lifetime warranty if you always have product failing right. and in the beginning people just didn't understand what we were doing they didn't they didn't believe it so it just took a long time and it started with a few bike builders that um, I just got to know by being at, say, Sturgis and Daytona and all these other events around the country, because that's kind of how we started. That's all I knew. Uh, and this is 1995, I think, somewhere uh -huh. in there. So there were magazines and these events, and that's all I knew about. So we'd show up to those, and for years we didn't sell anything, a couple years, even after we went through all that development. And then a couple of builders, Ron Sims, Jim Nassi, quite a few guys in the industry that built bikes really liked it because of how low the bike would get. That's honestly what they were attracted to. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the bike was finished and built and they rode it, they were floored. And then slowly, 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 that word spread. And then by 1998, um, kind of one of our tipping points was 
Hot Bike Magazine, I sent a kit to them and they did an install, put it on a bike. At the end of that season, then we won uh, most innovative product of the year. And that helped. It's not like, boom, we were in business, but it really made a difference. And then we racked up a couple of more awards and a few more years go by and people are, I guess, are a little bit more used to it. More air suspensions were start coming out on cars and other vehicles that helped us. And now air suspension is pretty common, really. It's on a lot of automotive vehicles that come right from GM or Ford or whoever. So that's helped us a bit, but in the beginning, it sucked. <laughs> Nobody wanted it, so. Well, more power to you. I stuck it out, and now the industry thanks you for all that you've you know, really brought to the table. It's, it's been impressive what you guys have done so far. I mean, now at this point, you guys offer the Aero for touring models, for trikes, for dynas, V-Rod, soft tails, you know, which is absolutely awesome. And um, I know you basically, for all those models, you basically have two systems that you offer for the Aero, um, the exception being for the touring model, which is the HVG, which is still an air compression suspension. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the only difference between the Aero with the HVG is that it comes with a hand pump compared yeah, to the yeah. pump on the bike. Pretty much all of our suspensions come with a complete kit. Well, they all do. Handlebar control, a wiring harness, and the compressor. Everything's already mounted on any bracketry you need to put on the bike, so it goes directly on. But the HVG model is just a hand pump that, that we um, get from a company called Lazine. So it's got an inline gauge on it. It's 1175 bucks, I think, retail, and it was... We just put that out there, so if somebody wanted to buy air suspension, but they maybe couldn't afford the entire kit, we thought this might at least get them the shocks and a way to get the product. And then we have a separate part number that has absolutely every other piece that you need if you want to make it complete down the road. So okay. we just thought we'd give them an option of buying it in pieces or a, a couple bit. of part numbers. So. Right. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. You're giving your customers some options to work with, definitely. Yeah. Um, now, if you know, if I had a touring bike, what would be the biggest advantages of buying, you know, the Aero versus the Aero A? You know, what would really tip my scale for for either one? You do feel a little bit of that in the Aero A. Um, we've got six different settings on there. They're just they're real easy to read. It's one through six on the damper body. Mm -hmm. You just turn the knob. The reason we do that is it's one more level of what we call rider ID because there's so many different uses for an air suspension and a coil for that matter, but everyone has their own idea or perception of what rider quality is. It means something different to me than it does to you or anyone else. So we want that tunability. So if you have a personal preference and say you like it to ride extra soft, you can set your either your spring or your air spring on the soft side, and you can adjust your, your body of the shock the same way if you choose. And what we found is every single rider that we talk to uses the product different. But at the end, they all love the result. And that's what we're looking for because we can't determine that setting in the body and get it right for everybody. Right. But for, for half of the people that buy the product, they maybe don't want that adjustability or they just want to put it on and ride the bike and not think about it. But there's always that guy, we always got to be messing with something. So <laughs> yeah, if you make it a, a tiny little bit better, you should. So that's kind of what we do. Just a lot more adjustability. Now, but I mean, you can still get the same performance and quality out of the Aero. The Aero A just allows a little bit more fine dialing in. Yes, correct. So um, the reason that's important is there's such a variance in rider weights. Mm -hmm. And then you take that in conjunction with the rider, the rider ID or their preference of the way it rides. When you, uh, when you adjust that knob, really what you're doing is adjusting how much the fluid flows inside the body. And that does affect the ride quality. Most of your ride quality is in that spring and the spring rate that we talked about earlier. But there is some ride quality changes when you do start adjusting that body. So if someone likes 
maybe um, say an older guy, 80 years old, he's just cruising around, wants the softest ride possible. Someone 20 years old gets on it and they just want to go as fast as they can possibly go and corner and really ride the bike the way it can be ridden. They're going to set it up and use that higher range of adjustability on the body, maybe be in the four, five, or six range. For the older person, maybe that wants to just cruise, they're going to be on that lower setting, like say one or two, because it's going to flow a lot more fluid and be a lot more soft and compliant. Right. If that makes sense. Definitely. Okay. And I mean, all your products do come with really nice, you know, easy to follow instructions. Um, all your wiring, you've made it really easy for the end user. It's all plug and play, which is amazing. Um, I know you have videos out there talking about once you get suspension on the bike and how to adjust it and to really dial in like you talk about and I know you mentioned the lifetime warranty which is absolutely awesome considering the fact that these things can take a beating you know these people can go anywhere from just a cruise around town to crossing the border into Mexico you know and, and god knows what those roads look like down there <laughs> yeah and we, do have, we have riders that test for us um a couple of guys that literally one guy has lived on his motorcycle lived on it since like the mid 90s incredible <laughs> and so we put shocks on his bike all the time wherever he's at and he does ride through mexico like this time of year he's there <laughs> and while it's cold he just rides so i think what the last bike that he just finally had to retire it actually is going to harley to the museum i think wow it had over a million miles i can't remember the number somewhere in that range but he is an animal he just rides and rides and rides <laughs> and we got a few guys that do that for us and they just go and it's great feedback so we'll get them after a couple hundred thousand miles we'll take them apart put them on our shock dyno run our tests on them and uh just check them out so we're fortunate to have a few guys that just go out there and ride 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 so yeah it's incredible i mean it's it's even impressive that you guys would you know obviously do all your testing beforehand, but then let someone go out and beat the crap out of them and then get them back and say, all right, you know, let's test and see where this really broke down. And really, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it really allows for you guys to continue to develop a product that's going to last and last. So we're working on a with three of our riders to go coast to coast in Russia. So, and that is a tough one. But they're doing it. One of them, they're, they all ride road glides or street glides, which is challenging in itself if right. you're not on pavement. They're putting a plan together, and I'm going to support them to do it because it's great feedback for us. We'll have our front and rear suspensions in them. And I know yeah. we can handle it. I don't know what else will fail next, but I know <laughs> our product will make it. <laughs> so now that, I mean, you guys have got the air suspension system dialed in and covered, um, and obviously you guys are still getting great feedback for, for the development. You not too long ago went back to the drawing board and you developed a really nice uh, coil shock. So the Legend Revo and the Legend Revo A. Um, and you have them obviously available for the Touring, the Dyna, the V-Rod, and the Sportster. And what I thought was pretty cool, and you guys can maybe explain this a little bit, also the, um, the FXRs. I mean, I thought that was really cool for an older bike that you guys really decided to offer modern technology and, and ride suspension. I mean, what were you guys thinking for the FXRs? There's just uh, there's quite a few that are digging those out and uh -huh. buying them up. People love the Evo engine. It's that particular model is kind of a, it's a classic, but yet it's kind of a hot rod. So it's kind of a cool mix in between and people are doing some really cool stuff for them and they definitely need suspension. So <laughs> upgrades. If you're going to ride them hard and a lot of guys that, or gals, anybody that's fixing those bikes up is riding them pretty hard, usually. So, yeah, we definitely wanted to be in those. I'm a fan of those bikes anyway, so I definitely wanted yeah. to be on more of a personal preference. There's not really a huge market, but. No, I, so I, I wanted to point that out because I, I do. I think it's really awesome that you guys chose to really bring some modern technology to the older bikes because they definitely need it. Yeah, it helps a lot, for sure. <laughs> Um, so what were your, you know, if you guys started with the air suspension shocks and you guys got, you know, bumpy star, but eventually you kept with it, you know, what were you thinking as far as the coil shocks, what were your reasons to bring that to the table? Um, a lot of it was price point and then 
as I rode a lot of different coil shocks before we just started going down that path, I knew we'd always get into that side of the market, but I think we stayed away from it 12, 15 years, maybe something like that. And we, because I know air suspension, I know ours anyway, is really top of the line and it can perform and hang in there with the coil shock and ours will, it'll do anything a coil will and do it well. But price point was always tough for us with the air suspension because the, the air springs are expensive. The compressor that I chose and have made is expensive. I really work hard to keep everything made in the U S which is not cheap. So right. our product, so it's not cheap, but I think it's a value even at the high price because you do get what you pay for and we make sure that you're happy with it. And we wanted the same thing in the coil, but we wanted to be as cost effective as we could. So we just changed the way we designed it and thought about that shock. And that's how we came up with some different spring rates, a little bit different way of handling the fluid in the body and still kept it fairly cost effective because we make all the parts here we're in control of a lot of those things. So nice. um, it was really a price point thing at the beginning, and then it turned into a lot more than that once we started going down that path because I just cannot take an average, normal, cheap, <laughs> or, or we can't, you can't take a good product and make it cheap. Well, you shouldn't. It was, it was really hard to give them, give the customer the best value for the dollar. And we think we finally got there before we released it because we had talked about maybe not releasing those because we weren't getting where we wanted to price point wise. And then we, after testing and a few other odds and ends, we were able to come up with a few different ways um, to keep the, the pricing down on the manufacturing side. So, it's it's how we ended up at seven hundred dollars and nine hundred, which is really reasonable for the shock that you get. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would personally say the quality that you guys put out is unsurpassed. I mean, not to mention obviously the lifetime warranty, but you know, people don't bat their eyes when you tell them their seat costs them five six hundred dollars, and right. know, at the end of the day, it's your suspension that's going to have the biggest overall impact. So. I think you guys did a great job, you know, asking too much. And I think it's the, the fact that the customer chooses to be educated about what it is that they're putting their money towards. I well, think and if we worked on the margins that some of the companies that bring all this stuff in from overseas, our shocks would be $1,200 probably instead of 900 But we just don't have that luxury of working on those huge margins because we don't order the stuff on by freight or on a boat coming from China. We make it, you know, by hand. Right. So we, um, we just have gotten used to not working on, on some of the margins that maybe other companies have. And we've, it's just made us a better manufacturing company trying to stick to our guns and make it here and make it very, very well, better than the other shocks in my opinion. So once you just swallow that pill, you figure out how to manufacture it better. And we've started a few, quite a few years back, we started doing lean manufacturing and it's a Toyota following the Toyota principles on how they handle production and most automotive makers. That's really made a lot better company out of us. And it's allowed us to produce quality products at a pretty decent price. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's impressive that, you know, you'll challenge yourself to always improve and, you know, stick with your guns. It's always a good idea. Yep. <laughs> um, so let's talk more about the Revo shocks, the coil shocks. I know the air suspension, you guys really dialed in, you did a great job. Can you talk about maybe what would be some of the benefits? Obviously the price point we talked about, um, but can you talk about any of the major benefits of running the coil shock over the air? Yeah, cost is definitely the obvious one. Um, and some people do just want to put the shock on the bike and forget about it. And if, if that's what you want to do, the coil shock, the Revo is definitely the way to go because, and one major reason for that is the way we do the spring so much different than everyone else. It gives us a really large sweet spot, meaning a lot of the time you can set it, set that sag for the rider mm -hmm. 
and most of the time carry a passenger if you're going to do a day or so riding you know you wouldn't want to ride 10 days in a row without readjusting the shocks but if someone's going to jump on the back and be on there for a few hours you really don't have to mess with the shock so user wise it's super user friendly real easy to set if you do want to make adjustments um, and you're going to say take a 10 day vacation or something riding two up with all your gear it's literally a matter of a minute or two you undo the saddlebag pins at the top you can just kind of lean the saddlebag towards you against your knees and you just grab the coil itself and turn it to adjust that preload so even if you do have to adjust it we make that super simple as well you don't need any tools anything like that so yeah, yeah you guys really made it super easy for the user um <clears throat> now what would you say i mean obviously we talked about the adjustability for the air suspension versus the Aero A and the regular Aero. Um, is that the same carryover principle for the Revo and the Revo A? It's just more tunability and a little bit more dialed in? Yeah, and all of the non-adjustable um, damper bodies are set on our number three setting if it were our adjustable shock. So we just kind of hit that, the non-adjustable versions right in the middle of the road to kind of just play both sides of the fence almost. Right. But it does apply on the Revo kind of the same way. A sport rider or someone that's going to really ride the bike aggressive is just going to be in those higher settings. Um, and then if they do want to just cruise, let's say they rip through the mountains and they've got it set up pretty stiff so they can corner and keep the ride height high, you can just turn that knob as well back down to say two or three and really change the ride of it. And the spring is so flexible that it'll allow you to do that. You can make that shock really ride way different just by adjusting the damper body and not messing with the coil. So it's even more so obvious the advantages of that adjustability on the coil shock than it is the air rod. And um, the Revo comes in 12, 13, or 14 inch, uh, so the customer can kind of choose. You know, if I just had a stock bike, is it usually a good idea to just replace whatever length it was that I started with? In most cases, yes. Um, we always recommend the longest shock that can fit on the bike. So let's say a road glide or a street glide that certain models come with the 12 inch. We always try to talk them into the 13 because you can set the shock so you're still at that 12, 12 and a half, but there's a whole lot more wheel travel there. If you're taking one inch out of three inches, you're losing a third of it, which is a big difference. It's it sometimes it's the difference between bottoming out real hard on that bump or those railroad tracks and not feeling it at all. So right. that does make a difference. So we try to get we try to get the rider to use that as much length as possible. Some riders just can't. It's you know they're they're short and there's no way around it. So right. um, there just isn't an option at that point. But if they've got plenty of height. They can handle the bike well. We try to make them run the longer shock. It def they're happier in the end. Even if they like the look of the shock a little bit lower, by the time they're sitting on it, it's going to look about the same. Good to know. And you also offer them in uh, either standard or heavy duty. This is usually pretty straightforward, but when would you really recommend someone moving forward with the heavy duty? Yes, and especially in our brand because of the way we handle the coil because our heavy duty is about 110 pound spring, depending on the model, but in general, it's about 110. Okay. And that's still 40 pounds lighter than most everyone else's normal shock, even in our heavy duty version, because the extra length that we wind in the coil makes that, sh that spring and that shock act and almost think as though it's a heavier spring in it, and it is, and it's more compliant and soft. You can be, a, what I'm trying to say is you can be a real light rider with our, with our Revos and get the heavy duty model and not be disappointed because they're okay. still riding better than most other shocks. I mean, when would I really make the decision? Because a lot of people, you know, they think I'm not over a certain weight. You know, why would I really go with a heavy duty over a standard? Well, yeah, and you're right by pushing to the heavier model because we have guys, let's say they're... 160 to 180 pretty average size they could ride our normal shock and be extremely happy they could literally 
ride the heavy duty back to back to it and not feel the difference because they're the way just because of the way our coil works it's so unique to anything else that's out there and mm -hmm. so you don't have to be heavy with ours to ride the heavy duty model by any means it just gives you the ability to on those weekend trips or those long trips to really load the bike up and have the extra adjustability in it to carry the load so right and I, yeah definitely for people who you know they like to ride solo but they don't want to feel like they can't ride with a passenger because their shocks aren't set up for a heavy duty application and i think it's a great that you guys kind of gave them both options you know don't be afraid to run the heavy duty it will work just fine yeah if you if you run a heavy duty let's say our competitors it's going to feel like a heavy duty say a one ton work truck type ride like you've got way too much shock on there for the weight of the rider. Ours is the opposite. You just you don't know that it's a heavy duty shock when you're riding it, honestly. So, I mean, you guys have definitely done your homework. Um, you brought some great products to the market. I know uh, our riders are loving the difference that they're experiencing once they put a set of shocks on, whether it's the Aero or the Revo. And I know you recently, not too long ago, put out the front end suspension. Um, I know you just released them for the touring models so far. I'm sure that will eventually change. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. That is um, pretty unique as well. We we try to not just um, release products that are like everybody else's. So mm -hmm. we have a quite a bit different spring rate again. We choose to um, a lot of front ends out there will have a damper rod on one side and a spring on the other which it works in some applications but these big heavy bikes that are really under sprung when you buy them meaning the front end is way too soft they do that to have it be a nice compliant ride in the front i think because the rear is so terrible but it really makes for an ill handling bike makes it not corner right kind of dangerous if you get in a panic situation or have to maneuver under braking so we choose to go with a, a quite a bit higher spring rate, but we give it a lot of adjustability. So almost the opposite of our rear shocks because most of your ride quality is coming out of the rear, but your handling and performance is coming out of the front. So we stiffen the front, soften the rear, and then in the front, to keep the best ride quality we can, even though the spring is a little stiffer, there's four inches of travel typically in the front end. The first couple inches will give you a pretty nice compliant ride, but then you start pushing on a nitrogen piston that's inside as well. So it's kind of like a second stage um, in that front end. So if you grab a handful of front brake, you don't travel all the way through that soft front end. You get part way through it and then you'll feel it really change on you. So you can really maneuver, set the bike in a corner, and not have the floorboards rub, have it kind of wiggle and, and be squishy feeling in the corner. A lot of that feeling is coming from the front end and we're able to take that completely out of it and do it pretty cost effective. That front end retails at 750, kind of like a lot of our other products. It's really in that thousand to $1,200 range is what that front end should be. So we really work, do our best and work on the efficiencies here to make sure we can run on a thin margin and keep those prices down. Definitely. Um, but it's, of course, in my opinion, the best front end that's out there. But, <laughs> of course, um, and I'm sure you guys will continue to improve. <laughs> yeah, what's nice to hear is the people, our test riders and the, the handful of people that have been buying them since we released them are truly beside themselves on how well they work. So. I think since you've really convinced your customer uh, the ride quality that they get with the rear, you know, the front, I was, I was personally pretty excited to see that the front end was coming out. I think it's going to be a big game changer, you know, especially considering, you know, like you said, a panic situation where your front brake, when that weight switches, you really got to rely on it. I know the rear brake is really important. It's going to help, but yeah, it's impressive how important that really is. You can have the ABS on ours fully activated and chattering and it'll stay perfectly straight and true. And you can actually corner a couple of times and maneuver with it activated. So it's definitely, it's one of the most, uh, one of my most uh, 
favorite things about the front end is the safety factor in it because it can make an average rider pretty damn good. If you're coming into a corner too hot or have a situation, hopefully it can keep a lot of riders from going down. And right. it really will from the testing we've done. So Yeah, it's, it's impressive. I'm excited. Um, I know it's only offered in the touring models. And, uh, yeah, we don't have your model ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, just the touring. I'm sure you guys have it in the works. We're messing with it, yeah. Wait, are you having any more difficulties? I mean, I know the touring bikes are so big, and they really need that the extra front end um, cushion with, with the weight and everything, but uh, is that really what your main reason was as far as moving forward with the touring bikes first? Um, popularity of that bike, of course, is, is driving it for us. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's our most popular rear selling front suspension, Okay. we knew it would probably take off well for the fronts. Right. Um, and of course, we we designed the thing to work the best with our rears, and that's what we're hoping is the way our pricing is. We try to keep them both cost effective together. Really, for about fifteen hundred dollars, you can equip the front and the rear really well. So it's about the price of an air suspension if you wanted to either decide if you want to put that on the rear or maybe do front and rear as a package. That's what we're trying to do with the fronts. And it's, it's really why we came out in the FL market first. And they're, they're probably the hardest one to make work right. So now it's a matter of scaling the components, some different springs and a few odds and ends. So it, it shouldn't be as big as a challenge. We won't have a couple of years in it like we did uh, with these. So I can't tell you when because I don't know. And every time I say, oh, it'll be spring, then it takes another year. So I just don't say anymore. <laughs> Because I'll let it be a surprise to me as well. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I mean, it's exciting to hear that you're working it for the other models as well. I think it's important to have it available for the people that want it and that the ones that really do appreciate it really will run it. I, I don't think you'll have as much uh, difficulty winning over the market with the front end, especially since the rear and everything went so well. And now you've really gotten yourself out there. People are learning about it. They're not afraid of the brand. They're not afraid of this new, new yeah. idea, new technology. So. I'm sure you have a good response, and hopefully we'll get some other models out as well. Yeah, right. We will. <laughs> um, and those are also offered in the standard and the one-inch lowered. What were you thinking about uh, the one-inch? What was your ma main reason for offering? You know, why wouldn't you just go with standard? Some, I would choose to, honestly. But some bikes now are coming with one-inch lowered, mm -hmm. front ends as well as the rears. There's certain dealerships or certain riders that just won't put in a standard length front end, even though it's an inch. There's a big misconception, I think, that lowering the front end helps your ride height be lower, and it truly really doesn't. Uh, most of that happens in the rear, and I always, if somebody wants to have a stance that's a little bit lower, I always recommend leaving the front end standard height and... Mm -hmm run a one inch lower shock on the rear. It's not great and I would definitely never recommend it, but if they're absolutely set on having the thing a little bit lower, just lower the rear. Yeah. But now that a, now that a handful of bikes come with a lowered front end stock, we felt that we had to or we'd lose a few sales. And an inch is okay. It's still not great. I don't like to lower anything, but <laughs> unless it's with an red. Um, <laughs> but you can definitely feel a big difference in the one inch lowered or the standard length, just like everything. It performs better at normal height. So. Right. Um, and all your, you know, the front end comes right to drop in the bike and you guys, again, give easy installation. As if, so, I mean, you guys, I think you did a great job. I'm excited to see the future for your company. You know, I'm sure it'll continue to improve. And what else you got going on? Anything else in the pipeline or you're going to stick with where you are uh, just out the front? No, we do. We work on a lot of off-road, too, like um, UTV models, Razors, Rangers, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of pretty exciting stuff we're messing with there, but it's a couple years out, but um, we're always thinking two or three years ahead. So um, you have to, yeah. it's something different than, than bikes, which is kind of fun again. And it's <laughs> great to test them, so you just go out and let it rip. <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> Definitely. Well, Jesse, I don't want to take up any more of your time. It's been great talking with you and going over some of this stuff. I'm excited to share everything with our consumers. I think they'll be really happy with what, you know, we have to tell them and I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Yeah. So, but, uh, all right. Thank you, Jesse. We'll all right. Be- thank you.